Hi, my name is Nicole Lasham, and I'm the editor-in-chief of the Rainbow Times, New England's largest LGBTQ newspaper since 2006. Throughout these past 12 years, we've covered issues not only relating directly to the LGBTQ community, but also all of our individual, shared, and collective identities. This year, we wanted to sit down with the Salem at-large city council candidates and incumbents to find out exactly where they stand on the issues that impact all of us, especially those of us that live, work, play, and thrive in Salem. I'd like to thank all of the candidates that took the time to sit down with us in this intensive one-on-one -on -one interview giving us for more than 45 minutes of their time so that you could understand, so that I could understand, so that we could collectively understand where exactly they stand on these issues. Those that participated were Melissa Faulkner, Conrad Prusniewski, George McCobb, Domingo Dominguez, Ty Hapworth, Alice Merkel, Elaine Milo, and last but not least, Jeff Cohen. Although all candidates were invited to participate, unfortunately, Bell Steadman and Gary Gill declined to be interviewed for the series. Likewise, Art Sargent was not able to be reached via email or phone and did not reply to our requests. On behalf of the Rainbow Times, its management and staff, our publisher, Grayson Ocasio, and myself. We thank you for watching this series. We hope that you learn just as much as we did. Let's get started. George, thank you so much for coming in and sitting down with us today. We really appreciate having you here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. And t can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Because this is the first time that I'm having an opportunity to really sit down and get to know you. So tell us about yourself. Well, thank you. I appreciate that opportunity. There's a, there's a lot of people in Salem that, that don't know me, and there's a lot that are. And uh, I'm from Salem. I was born and brought up on North Street, and uh, I've lived here for 61 years. I've never moved. Uh, I. Uh, Grew up in, like I say, North Street, and as kids, we went to St. John's Prep in Danvers, and I went to Salem State College and took political science, and I got elected to the city council for more than six when I was 24 years old. Wow. Which was quite an honor for me. I bet. That's young. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah, yeah. great. Unfortunately, my, my dad had passed away, and he was the ward council there. Mm -hmm. Actually, here, it was in this ward. Um, and um, he was, I was 22 years old, and I ran the first time, you know, for a special election, and just missed, and then I ran again, and I won, and I was, you know, the rest was history. So I served four years in Ward 6, and then I served, uh, my wife and I got married, and my daughter Erin uh, was born, and we moved to South Salem, and we've been there for the last 30-something years. Wow. And uh, I became a counselor at large and served till 1996, um, when I moved on, and then went to work for Congressman Tierney in his campaign as his mm -hmm. field director and political director mm -hmm. back in 1996 and 97. He hired me as his, legis not legislative, I keep saying that, but his, uh, his district aide um, mm -hmm. to deal with, you know, cities and towns and municipal issues and federal issues and state issues. So I learned a tremendous amount of government operations by working for John and uh, Mm -hmm. And he was, he was a pretty effective congressman when it came to those types of things. He mm -hmm. um, goes paid attention to it. And uh, yeah, we did a lot of work with Salem, PB, though. Obviously, the cities get more attention because they're a little bit bigger, but we do a lot of stuff with the towns, too. You know, mm -hmm. we learned how that worked. Um, and I stayed with him until around 2011 okay. um, when I left uh, because politics, the 25 years, I needed a break. It was just, especially the Washington stuff and the, yeah. the national stuff was just beginning to get mm -hmm. right. <laughs> what we're seeing today. Right. Um, so it was a nice break. So what was your motivation to jump back into politics? Well, it's, uh, it, it, it wasn't planned. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've, always, I've always enjoyed politics. I started a business when I left uh, Congressman Tierney's office. I founded and owned, my daughter now owns actually, uh, co-owned North Shore Bartending Services, mm -hmm. and we provide uh, concession services at concerts and weddings and all kinds of things. Cool. 
Yeah, it, it's it's fun, and I, I I wanted to build a business for her and myself and my yeah. family, and you know we and we did that, and um, and I had no real plans to run for office. You know, things started to get a little better. We were able to put, you know fix up the house a little bit, yeah. go on a vacation now and then. It just you know as you get older, things just get a little sure. better. And then then I got sick. Um, I was diagnosed with a disease that was a lung disease that I'd never heard of before, and um, to make a long story short, I ended up having a lung transplant, a double lung transplant. Wow, that's major. Yeah, and this was, this was back in uh, 19, excuse me, I keep saying 19, uh, 2017, this all happened, and no one really knew because it was uh, physically, outwardly, I was okay, um, but I got pneumonia just before Christmas of that year, and I had passed all the tests to get on the list, and I was fortunate enough to get that transplant. So that, that was a kind of a life-changing experience for me and my family, but it also told me that you, and my doctor said, you know, you gotta, you know, we know you like to run around and make money, but you gotta take it easy. Well, right. So, uh, and, I, and I did, you know, and I take care of myself and go to the gym and all that. So when, when this opportunity arose, I said to myself, you know, I have the time, I'm not sick, I can do this. Mm -hmm. And uh, I talked to my wife about it, and she said, you know, go for it. She said, you, you might as well. And, uh, and we've been having fun. I mean, I'm having a ball doing this. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm glad you're not sick yeah. anymore. So yeah. that's a great thing, obviously. Yeah. And um, it's great that you're running for at-large. Why did you choose at-large as opposed to, like, a ward counselor or something like that? Well, I've been both. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I know, uh, I live in Watch 7. Counselor Dibble is a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't run against them. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be a ward counselor. I think my skills are more geared towards the larger picture things yeah. and my, my skill set from my experience with Congress and everything else. So, But I think I can be a leader in, in the city. I think I can be a mentor to the younger folks. I can be a mentor to ward counselors. I mean, I know this business. Mm -hmm. And I know, you know, I think there's some traditions that people need to keep up with. And, you know, mm -hmm. you have to have some camaraderie around building consensus and sure. lacking a little bit of that today. And we, we need to fix that, mm -hmm. too. So. But those are kind of really the reasons that I'm running, and I, and I, I really just I love serving my community. And what are some of those issues that you think um, consensus needs to be built around? Oh, I, I, you know, some of them I can't understand why consensus has not been built around them, mm -hmm. specifically the housing issues, because mm -hmm. they are not as they're not as dangerous as some people may make you think, or the, 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 you know, there's some misinformation about these things out there. Even if both of the proposals are before the council, the overlay district and in the uh, accessory housing unit thing passed, we're not going to solve the problem. It's not going to create a tremendous number of units. But there are two tools that we could put on the table right now mm -hmm. and help people. Mm -hmm. And it's not unusual for all school buildings to become housing mm -hmm. units. Uh, I grew up in Ward 6 in the Pickering School, the Cogswell School, the Sheridan School. We're all apartments or condominiums now, and they were done that way through special permit process. So mm -hmm. it can be done on these buildings individually, but collectively we know that they're all almost ready to be redeveloped. Right. So why not make the proposal? I don't, I don't see that there was a lot of reason to not support it, mm -hmm. given the minimal impact we're really going to have, because most of it's going to be market rate. Mm -hmm. you know, um, it's, it's, it's a tough issue. So and where are you on um, affordable housing? Because I, I know there's a lot of... Um, Obviously, a lot of discussion about it. We yeah. have a lot of people, Salemites, old and new, that um, are, ha you know, having a really difficult time making ends meet. The, it's true, and it's it, what we, what we can do. One is we can pass those things. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think those are kind of no brainers. I mean, mm -hmm. I do have, a, you know, one of the things with the accessory dwelling units is that. I do think it shouldn't be by right. I still think there should be a special permit process, even if it's streamlined or however you can work it legally, mm -hmm. because I think there should be a light shined on each one of them so that we don't see, you know, people with development opportunities trying to do this. And they put in some frame, time frames, and I, you know, for two years in home ownership, uh, home occupied, home owner occupied, occupied. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those are the types of things you have to do. You, mm -hmm. you can't make it a development opportunity. I don't know if you'll see a lot of them. I mean, I, I think it's, it'll be good for people that might be have be able to put up the twenty or thirty thousand dollars it's going to take to build it, mm -hmm. and then stay in their home and you know take that income and use it to pay their taxes or whatever it is, rather than you know and and you know there's college students, there's firefighters, there's teachers. I mean, there are professionals that you know it's true they can't afford to on their salaries mm -hmm. to live here, or they, right. but without you know sacrificing a lot. Mm -hmm. 
In terms of developing new housing, are you, um, I know about using like the older buildings and stuff like mm -hmm. that and redeveloping them. Are you also in support of new development, like from the ground up for housing? I would, I would love to see us start right now with a long-term plan for senior and veterans housing. Mm -hmm. it, the, 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 the stock that we have and all the projects, they were built back in the 60s. Yes. And they're, they're, they're in need of maintenance. They're, 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 cost, they're costly to maintain. Mm -hmm. And there's just not enough of them. I mean, a lot of the people, a lot of the housing crisis, it's not just the young people that don't earn money, it's the older people on the other end that are sitting in their homes. Mm -hmm. And if they have to sell, you know, we should have an opportunity, you know, for them here in Salem. We need, and we need more of it. I mean, we can't obviously fit everybody in Salem, but, mm -hmm. you know, people that live here should have that opportunity. What does uh, that look like to you, George? What does it look like to me? Yeah. It, it looks like the housing, the housing Authority developing more units. Mm -hmm. um, that comes with federal and state regulation because that's probably where the money would come from. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the eligibility criteria for those homes would it would probably be the same as it is now, but there'd be more of them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a need for it. I'm not sure the placement of them, with a, you, you know, how that whole thing would work, but there's definitely a need for it. And, and some of them are just in bad shape. I mean, uh, you know, the, and, the, and there are pieces of property, not parkland, but there are some city-owned properties that might be able to be used at some point in time for that, but mm -hmm. you know, I think we should we should do our best mm -hmm. in what otherwise is a market driven. You know. Right. In terms of um, development and business and economic development, things mm -hmm. like that, what we can do downtown and in other areas of the city. I mean, Ward Six obviously has a lot of other space that we could utilize into whatever um, whatever needs there 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 may be. Um, in terms of development, are you pro-development or are you like one of the candidates that is more like, no, we need to slow down on the development? Well, I'm not as, you have to be careful about development, but you never can really slow down. I mean, we've been in a, a boom with these projects, you know, the last 10 years or so. That could end. Right. <laughs> you know, sometimes projects lie right. idle. The one on Mason Street sat for several years before mm -hmm. it actually got built, you mm -hmm. know, until whatever happened, the financing of the economy changed or whatever. But, mm -hmm. You know, that's what happens when you have opportunities, you have to take them because it's good for the tax base. C cities have to grow. You know, they have to grow with new businesses. They have to grow with new developments or redevelopments, mm -hmm. mostly in Salem's case because we don't have a lot of, of vacant land. Yeah. But we've got to encourage that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we, we've got to try to encourage, you know, people, companies that can get here, high-tech companies and things like that that aren't, you know, that people can work from wherever and, mm -hmm. you know, not have to drive in every day. You know, we have economic zones in Salem. There's properties available that can do that, and we have to push that. And I'm sure they are. I'm, I'm not. Yeah. I mean, I think that I think Salem's grown a lot. There's been a lot of small businesses. I know in businesses like mine, which I relate to, just about any small business downtown, are all doing okay mm -hmm. because there's people here. You know, there's a need, um, and the city does. The city is a very welcoming city to work in. Yeah. I've been to some communities where they make it impossible. So we don't bother, right? You know. You know. In addition to um, obviously, in terms of businesses and, and bringing in revenue, yeah. obviously, Halloween October is a huge money-making stream for yeah. local businesses. I'm wondering what else we can do throughout the year to even boost those profits higher for business owners. What do you think about that? I, I think it's already spread. I, I think Salem is busy from April to December now. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't. See, it's not. It used to be October 31st or November 1st. Mm -hmm. It was dead. Not anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's, there's still a lot of people around, and then it goes right into the Christmas season. Mm -hmm. And this, this thing's happening downtown. You know, they've, they've mm -hmm. done a lot with the you know, Creative Salem and Main Street's program mm -hmm. and the Chamber of Commerce. I mean, mm -hmm. we work a lot with those folks. They do a lot of things mm -hmm. to bring people down. Family friendly yes. activities, you know, they have the Santa Claus and the hotel. There's annual activities that they have, but that's the type of thing that you know keeps business open an extra hour, and you know the restaurants and everything benefits from that. And uh, you know the museum is, you know, we are so fortunate. And, I mean, when I was younger and I was on the council, and they ought to pay more money, and that's just my stance. And the hospital ought to pay more money, but you know I didn't look at the bigger picture. I mean, exponentially, the, the you know the the money that's spent in the city from most place, from especially the museum, mm -hmm. is tremendous. I mean, they may not pay taxes, but uh, property right. taxes, but you know, they're, they're, they're buying hotel rooms, they're buying dinners, they're shopping, they're, you know, I did an analysis a couple of weeks ago of a wedding I did a couple, last year, or two years ago, I think mm -hmm. it was House of Seven Gables. Mm -hmm. 
Destination wedding, 200 people. Mm -hmm. Had to be at least 175 to $200,000 came into the city that day. Wow. That's, now that's the wedding, that's all the sure. guests with hotel rooms, that's, mm -hmm. you know, everybody spends in 100 bucks, and, mm -hmm. you know, it was pretty conservative. It wasn't, but that's, that's pretty good. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you do things like that, mm -hmm. and we find people that want to do those types of things outside of October now. They that's don't right. want to come, but they'll come in December, or they'll come that's in, right. you know, so. That's right. Do you find that over the years you have seen Salem grow and flourish and move away from being mostly known for the whole, you know, witch trial, um, scenario or do you think that we still need to do more to sort of uplift and embrace other um, you know history in Salem as opposed to just you know focusing primarily on witch trials for tourism well yeah we have a great maritime history you know we Salem has a tremendous history the neighborhoods have a tremendous history yeah. you know and it's, that's why it's so important that we preserve them we don't let them become you know overgrown with you know density properties and uh, density units of housing, but but no, I, I do think there's a, there's a lot more. You've got, you know, you've got, we've got our coastal, we've got, you know, the, the seafarers, I mean, there's just so many things that Salem has. I mean, yeah, we have the witches and, and it, it, you know, we have the statue and all that, and I mean, it, it's, that's pretty cool, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. everybody knew People you. People come for it, right? Yeah, right. So, you know, you uh -huh. say, yes, if, if you're out of state or you're away, you say, where are you from? I'm mm -hmm. from Salem, Mass. Oh, I, I know where that is. So I've heard that. Right. And, uh, my, actually, my wife ran into someone recently, and they asked her where she was from. She's from Salem. She said, well, aren't you lucky? Yeah. You know? it's, well, it's turned <laughs> into such a hub, yeah. a cultural hub for so many people that are flocking here, whether it's, yeah. you know, just to, um, to visit or to live. Right. And um, one of the questions that we are constantly asked, especially for this interview series, um, relates to accessibility mm -hmm. for people with disabilities. Yeah. And... You can look around the city, obviously, and you'll find, you know, sidewalks that are in really terrible conditions mm. that makes it difficult yeah, for that. people to navigate around, right? Yeah. Then, of course, we have, like, the cobblestone in Derby Square, which is beautiful. We want to keep its integrity, but it's not accessible, you know, to people mm. with disabilities. And the same thing goes with, like, some buildings, even that do have elevators, they're almost impossible to get to at times. So, I'm wondering, what would you propose or what would you do to make Salem more accessible to people with disabilities? Well, I'd have to look at what the, what they do now. I know that I know they've done quite a bit over the years, mm -hmm. you know, as far as the curb cuts and all that, but downtown is particularly, because of the surfaces, it's particularly hard to, to maneuver. I mean, I would support, you know, taking an overall look at things and looking at, you know, modern technology or, or ramps or whatever the case may be to allow people to move freely in and out of, you know, stores or you know, cross streets or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's important. I think we have an aging population. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that they may not have any car plates on their car, but they really need to be able to park close someplace, That's you right. know, and they, they can't really get around all that much. And, and you've got a lot of people that, you know, become ill, even if they're young. And, you know, so there's all kinds of those. So we need to be, we're a walkable city, we need to be an accessible city. And if it's not up to par where it should be, we should concentrate on that. Sidewalks, I've almost tripped a dozen times yes. in the last couple of months. Yes. And, you know, I'll be looking at a voter sheet and I'll be walking along and there's a tree and then all of a sudden there's a bump and I'm yes. like, whoa. Yeah. And it's just, and people that are on the list, I understand that, but geez, there's a lot of them, you know. Yeah. And um, so we need that, you know, I mean, that's obviously you can't do that with a wheelchair or if you need that that's crutches right. or something. So, you know, those things have to be taken care of. But I know the city does it incrementally and they have a list and, you know, some people tell me they're satisfied. Some people say, oh, it's been that for years. No one ever came. I don't know what it, the particular situations, but yeah, we got a dome. <laughs> right. You know. So, in considering obviously the costs and everything like that that mm -hmm. are associated to making um, things more accessible, what do you feel about um, like having a business improvement district? And what would the so basically benefit? business so, improvement district would be what? So, um, if if you look at the Boston model, Designation. for example. There are, you know, certain parameters set mm -hmm. in a certain area where business owners pay extra um, through some sort of levy or a tax, and they say, okay, in this area, we are operating as similar, like to what a nonprofit would operate with its own operating budget and all these things, where they can then make decisions to repair the sidewalk in front of their business if they want to, at no cost to the city. So it's um, it's almost like another way. For people to take more ownership 
of, um, they wouldn't own the city property, but they would be allowed to repair it if it's affecting their business. So in downtown, for example, maybe... Um, like a condominium association. Yeah, kind of something like that, mm -hmm. except for we're dealing with a mm -hmm. certain um, area as it relates to business owners. I, I mean, it sounds like a, a reasonable idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know if small business owners would be willing to do that. I think they expect the, the, the tax rate they pay to get services that the city can provide. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that, you know, a group of concerned owners wouldn't do it. I mean, uh, sure. but it's something that might not, they might not be able to sustain. I mean, the economy is good now. It, it's mm -hmm. not always good. Fortunately, in Salem, we've got something to offer. So mm -hmm. I'm very optimistic that we're going to be good for a long time yeah. here. Yeah, um, and I know like sometimes people also like they chip in the resources that are a part of like that association for the business improvement district, for yeah, example. Yeah. And then they market like together their district oh, yeah, and stuff things, like that as things, well. Yeah, yeah. And so there there are many different ways that it can yeah. be utilized, but it's basically at no cost to the city, but obviously it would need to be approved. Um, yeah, it would so, need to be approved. Yeah. And you'd, you'd need some type of legal language for that to be yeah. you know dealing with city property and all that. Mm -hmm. But hey, uh, you know. I'm all for it. I mean, if, 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 you know, business people sometimes can do that. Mm -hmm. And if you, if your business is healthy and you, you, I'm not going to wait six weeks to fix that sidewalk, I want to fix it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you know, because right. Because I got, you know, fortunately they right. have a good business and the money's coming in. So, sure. you know, they, they can fix it. Should we let them? Yeah. Maybe. Why not? I mean. Right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you would be open to it. Be open to it. Pending, yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Just you pending, know, pending the legalities of it and like whatever, that. you know, easements or sure. like sign offs or. You know, liability issues, you mm -hmm. know, those things come with that. So mm -hmm. but I don't think they're over, you know, overwhelming. But I do think business owners who pay a lot of taxes mm -hmm. expect to have some things done. And I, yeah. I'm not sure if that's occurred in Salem or not. Maybe it has. I, I, I don't know. But it's, 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 it's an idea. But, you know, I, I do think government's the first line. <laughs> and if mm -hmm. we can't do it, then right. but we should be doing it. Right. You know? Yeah, I hear you. Um, so what do you feel about the traffic and parking commission. This is like something that people are really talking about um, a lot and have been a little frustrated about. Um, I know that the Traffic and Parking Commission submitted a proposal to council two years ago in terms of how to expedite you know, processes for issues relating to traffic and parking. Mm -hmm. um, and that commission was developed initially with the intent to be able to oversee you know, these issues that are occurring in the city and be able to address them quickly. Council takes what seems to be forever to mm -hmm. get to issues, and that very proposal has been sitting there for what two is the years. Proposal? And so I don't know, I don't have access okay. to all of the details that's in that proposal, but I do know that the, the commission is supposed to be able to act independently and take some action toward alleviating some of the traffic and parking um, issues. But council's not doing much about it, even <coughs> though it's been established. Um, I'm not entirely sure of how how that works. The council does have the authority that has to have, has to enact the ordinances changes that it would require it for, on their recommendations. I'm assuming that's how it happens. I don't. If the proposal is for them to give up their authority to that board, I can see why they're probably holding it. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the proposal is, so I kind of reserve judgment mm -hmm. on it. But any eye that we have on this situation that can come up with some solutions is worthwhile listening to. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been, and I've been saying this for 30 years now, you know, North Salem is a, is a cut through, natural cut through to Peabody and, and Danvers mm -hmm. and Beverly. And so all the side streets get flooded with cars and we've made various one-way patterns and time between three and eight and did, you know, we just do things mm -hmm. to alleviate problems when we see them. Mm -hmm. um, and and we're, dealing, we're not dealing with, you know, easy streets either. So we're dealing with a bunch of old cow paths because mm -hmm. <laughs> that's why these streets yes. aren't all, you know, right. going in just one mm -hmm. angle. So they're all over the place. So it makes it difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but that said, the, the, you know, there's, there's, there's transportation issues. There's a local uh, shuttle that's proposed that I think is, is going to be worthwhile. I think mm -hmm. that a lot of cars can come off the street if we're able to get the funding and the construction of a, a platform in South Salem, mm -hmm. um, you know, a little bit away from the neighborhood so it's not intrusive of them. In Salem State, they can get walk there, you know, you know shuttle them, shuttle mm -hmm. people there. Salem Hospital will do the same thing. I mean, that's going to take a lot of cars off the road coming in each side of the city that are going to those institutions. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think those are the, that's one of the bigger things as far as getting cars off the road. And obviously, you, know, you get your bikes and your scooters and all that stuff, and it's, it's kind of fit. It's kind of, yeah. it's a tough urban fit. Yeah. 
-hmm. It's new to people. I understand it. You know, it, and people are easy to bash it. I'm not bashing it. I just, it, you know, made it last a little bit. It's different. Mm -hmm. You know, he says, I'm going down the street in a scooter. It's, mm -hmm. And it's like I've seen, from my experience, mostly I've seen young people on it, and they're having fun. I mean, it's fine. They're not driving a car. I mean, it's, have you tried one? No, I have no? not. I have not. <laughs> okay. if, I, if I did, I'd have knee pads on, and elbow yeah, pads. For sure. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. Helmet. <laughs> right. I want to jump back to the, um, to the parking commission for just the yes. traffic parking yeah. commission for a quick second. So in terms of the council, mm -hmm. because a proposal has been sitting in committee for two years, mm -hmm. Do you think that that is an acceptable time frame to sit on something? Or should the council be moving a little bit faster to approve or not whatever initiative it is? It depends. I mean, I don't know how they, I know they changed the committee structure a little bit. Um, there used to be a, a lot of different committees when I was on the council. Mm -hmm. You know, if the chairman wanted to hold something in committee because they didn't like it, they could. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's part of the body politic. I don't know specifically, and I thought a lot of these things died at the end of the year. I don't know if they still do or they carry over. So maybe it was carry over. I'm not sure of the specifics, mm -hmm. but if, if, if people are still waiting for an answer after two years, yeah, that's, that's kind of long. Mm -hmm. You know, at least tell us why you're not in committee. But right. I would imagine the committee chairman has changed in those two years. Probably, I don't know what committee it's in, but... Mm -hmm. um, I think I, it's in OLA, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I don't know why it would still be there, and I don't know what the proposal was, honestly. You know, mm -hmm. uh, both, both would, uh, I found out both of them, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. either way, I just, it's, um, it's one of those things where we want to make sure, when I, when I say we, I'm talking about people in yeah. general, yeah. Um, the people that have submitted questions to us, sure. want to make sure that the council is acting um, expediently and, and with intent and seriously, and not just shoving things that maybe a certain committee doesn't like, or maybe certain counselors don't like, into another, mm -hmm. you know, um, committee and it sits and and they say it sits and dies there. <laughs> and right. So, yeah. I'm, unfortunately, know. that that has been that's part of government. It has been part of government. It doesn't have to be. Right. I mean, you can you can vote on anything. You can report something out with a negative recommendation and let the board right. vote it up or down. Right. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. Again, I don't know the particular interest. I I, I do know that. Uh, you know, you can take it. <laughs> I'm thinking of an old story now, but. Um, <laughs> You can have things the president can ask to have it taken out of committee. If you get six votes, you can pull it out of committee. Mm -hmm. I, but I, I don't know the specifics of this. I mean, I, I did that before, and my finance chairman resigned, but he, he came back a couple of days later. Oh, right, right. <laughs> this is a long story, but a right, funny right, one. Right. Um, because I thought he was, he was holding up, I'll tell you the story, he was holding up a firefighter's bill, a firefighter's uh, appropriation for new leather helmets. And, mm -hmm. and I, it, my Pal, former Councilor Rich Schwinnick was <laughs> uh, my finance chairman. I was the president, and uh, I said, "Rich, you got to pull this out." You know, the firemen are like, "Oh, I want it. I think it's reasonable," and mm -hmm. he wouldn't pull it out. So I got the votes to pull it out. Mm -hmm. it's unusual, but you can do it. It's part of the rules. Sure. I got up to six votes to get it out, and I got to six votes to get it passed, and then Rich stood up and resigned. <laughs> oh, well. that's the, the way the cookie crumbles. The firemen right? got the firemen got the helmets. <laughs> <laughs> Richie came back a couple days later and said, right. okay, I'll take my job. <laughs> right. I think that, you know, people um, in general are just tired and feel like government, whether it's local or national, mm. are playing with their lives, right? And so, like, even when we consider things um, like uh, religion and policy, there are a lot of politicians that are um, putting their personal beliefs and their personal views into their politics okay. and in terms of what they are trying to impose on others. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on keeping whatever religious beliefs, um, if any, that you hold, separate from the betterment of the interests of the community? Well, I believe religion and politics doesn't mix. And I believe what's happening in the country today is mixing, is part of the problem is the religion and the, and the politics mixing. Mm -hmm. um, I hold very, um, I was brought up Catholic, I'm a practicing Catholic, but um, I'm a faith and spirit and you know, I, I like to help people, and I, I, you know, I don't, I don't have any conflict with my religious beliefs or anyone else's, for that matter. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to government, it really doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. Mm -hmm. You know, I can understand if it's a, a board on a holiday or a flag raise or something like that. That's fine. But mm -hmm. if you know, you're, you know, and especially in the city level, it doesn't matter as much because we, we're not partisan. So that, that tends to the religious beliefs come in more of the partisan social policies than. Would happen to city council, mm -hmm. but 
you know, that said, I, I don't see that really in Salem too much, and I don't, I don't see it as any conflict for me, and I, it's really not, I mean, I think, I, things that I think are morally right, I'll stand up for. I mean, I, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a Democrat, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not way left, and I'm not way right, I'm, I'm pretty much in the middle. The older I get, the more <laughs> to the middle I get. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's natural. I talk to a lot of people my age to say the same thing. Um, you know, but I, I, you know, I believe in social justice. I believe in people's rights. I believe in civil rights. I think everybody should be treated equally. Mm -hmm. And I see, you know, I find it offensive when they're not. Mm -hmm. And when I see it online or when I hear it, I, it it's offensive to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should not stand for that as a city. Right. Question for you, which takes me back to something highly contested, you know, in, formerly, and I'm sure you probably know where I'm going with this, the Sanctuary for Peace Ordinance. Yeah. People are still, um, some people are still very upset about it. Some people are super happy about it. Some people think that it needs to be stronger. Where do you stand on the Sanctuary Peace Ordinance in terms of, do you think it's good the way it is? Do you think that it needs to be, um, you know, even more, uh, have more strength and carry more weight? Or do you think it should be repealed? I think it is what it is. And and it is what it was before, and it is what it is now, if you understand that. Nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. You know, there was one written, and I respect the people who write. Jeff Cohen, I understand, was one of the authors. He said last night at the debate, um, and I know Councillor Epley was, was one of the authors, and I, I didn't feel when it was brought in that it was, that it, I thought it was brought in on a motion instead of thinking about what your job is as a city councillor, and I, you know, I didn't, I wasn't comfortable with that, looking at that from the outside. Mm -hmm. um, and then I saw the reaction to it, which confirmed my uncomfortability <laughs> because it was it was you know it was divisive and uh, you know we should not be you know regulating you know police powers or police uh, you know their policies by referendum we just shouldn't be doing that now I get the whole I'm on this side I'm on that side thing and the immigrant thing but that's all that's a, that's a that's an argument that's been set upon us by. From the top. I mean, that was a that was a divisive argument that's been national, and it came down to local in the last election. Mm -hmm. We didn't need to do it. It didn't change a thing. All it did was divide us. How do you feel it divided us? Because of the with the strongness of the opposition and the and the, and the people that were in favor of it. Mm -hmm. Now, I voted. I mean, I, I voted. Yeah, I was in favor of leaving it the way it was. I mean, I didn't really see it as a question, but I saw the I saw what happened with the question. Mm -hmm. You know, and I saw how, how nasty it got and. People, you know, just they, all kinds of crazy facts going on on both sides, and I just didn't see how the city got anything good out of it. I mean, it just it just divided us, and I think there's still some of that division. But I also think it's time to move on. I mean, the policy is the policy. The Salem Police Department is enforcing it. I don't see what the issue is. Now, people want to make it an issue, mm -hmm. but then you have to look at their agenda why they want to make it an issue. That's mm -hmm. the way I look at it. I think if you look at the, the, what's happening nationally right now with the immigrant community and mm -hmm. the, the abuses that are occurring, like with kids being you know, locked up, and I mean, even here in Massachusetts, there are horrific, you know, at detention centers, horrific things are happening. And so I think some people um, feel the need to you know, uphold and, and really strengthen that ordinance that we have. Other people are fine with leaving, uh, leaving it alone. But we have a very big immigrant community in Salem itself. And so although um, the ordinance may not um, have the same weight as like a law would have, for example, mm -hmm. um, it did provide the immigrant community a sense of knowing that they could, for example, call the police without fear of retribution. If someone, for example, was in a domestic violence situation, and may not call the police oh, okay. because they think that they're going to be caught and captured by ICE and taken away from their families. And so in that sense, do you find that the ordinance does carry some weight? Well, I certainly don't think that any of those policies, you know, at the federal level, I think they're all ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I think they're all politically motivated. Mm -hmm. And I think they're, they're made to divide the country. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's what's happening. I mean, it, it's, it's a terrible show to watch every time you have to watch the President of the United States say something. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. But that is filtered down. And, I, and people that live in this community should feel safe. They should feel mm -hmm. safe that the, the, the community police officers that are in their neighborhoods aren't going to, you know, they're not their enemies. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they, they, they're here to protect people. 
you know, I think we, we probably did fear them. The, that whole debate probably did put fear into them. Mm -hmm. You know, um, there are a lot of people that, that have come here legally and, and, and stay, and some people overstay, and that becomes an issue. And, and, and you know, and then you've got now some, you know, overzealous ICE people coming in to get every guy, even mm -hmm. though they might be productive and paying taxes. And, mm -hmm. you know, should they be legal? Yes. Should they go through the process? Yes. But the, the pro the fact is, there's a lot of people here that aren't, but they're still productive citizens that mm -hmm. should be treated as such. Mm -hmm. And, you know, running around saying I'm going to deport everybody just so you can get a second term is, to me, is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I think people in Massachusetts are smart enough to get it. People in Salem should be smart enough to get it. And we shouldn't throw that debate out again. You know, we should be reassuring our minority community not having it on the vote. I mean, I think the policy we have, it works, you know, and, you know, we should do everything we can to make them feel safe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So would you then say that, yes, you agree that there is a um, benefit to the ordinance in terms of the immigrant community feeling safer I hope so. in our city? I hope so. I mean, I, I, that was the intent. Um, it, the, the original ordinance was a lot, lot tougher, but it was, when it came down to when it came down to the final version, <clears throat> it was actually just an extension of the policy that the Salem Police Department had anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's what I mean when there was alarms going off, but nothing was changing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Except for the perception by the right, immigrant right. community. Yes, yes. Because that, that, that's a very big change. That, well, that, and that became right. real because of that, and, and because of the national stuff, and it came, mm -hmm. it came down. But, uh, you know, I, I just, I don't think, I don't think it's the debate that the city needs to have again. Mm -hmm. I really don't. I, I, you know, some people are just adamant about it. I know I've got knocked on the door and say, where are you in Sanctuary City? And I ask a question, and they go, ah, you don't know. And so it's, you know, it's, it's just... It's it's something that we have to be cognizant of, and we have to, you know, be aware of and, and take care of our immigrant community. But it's, I don't want to see another another question like that on the ballot. I don't think it does anybody any good. Do you think that civil rights should ever be on the ballot? Hmm? Do you think anything relating to civil rights should ever be on the ballot? Well, it, it, well, I don't think we have to. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we, we have people just have to. I believe in people's civil rights. When they're violated, <clears throat> they can be prosecuted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't think we have to put that on the ballot. I think that problem was solved. I mm -hmm. think we did that back in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, with Martin Luther King and, and uh, everyone else that, you know, brought that, you know, the civil rights movement. You know, I was a little boy back then, and I remember it. And, uh, you know, and it was, it was a pretty big deal. You know, that and the Vietnam War. And this country was, it was in a different type of turmoil than it is now, but it was in a turmoil. Mm -hmm. You know, guys were, you know, neighbors were going to Vietnam, you know, there was the riots, and there was, it, it, was a, it was a turbulent time. And probably 10 years old watching that on, you know, CBS News of Walter Cronkite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, I mean, that's, that's, that was the real world, you know, watching the 1968 convention in Chicago. I mean, riots in the streets. You know, that, that civil rights battle was fought, and, and we won. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so mm -hmm. we shouldn't go backwards. We should prosecute. And what about, where did you stand on yes on three in the last election cycle, the ballot question on transgender um, people being protected in public spaces? That was, um, yes on three was um, the initiative that would literally uphold the Massachusetts law that was passed in 2016, saying transgender people should have a right to be protected in public spaces the same way that anyone else has those rights. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, everybody should, I'm not, I'll never support taking rights away from anybody. I think everybody's free to choose. You know, people, some people don't, might not agree with me, but I think everyone's, everyone's in, an individual. Everyone has, you know, different things. I mean, we all have our own preferences in life. You know, but we also have to understand that we're all human beings, mm -hmm. and we've all got things going on in our lives. You know, when, with all the barking and, and the bickering that goes on in this world, I wish people would start to think about what might be going on in the other person's life. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone's got an illness or, or, or a sick family member or, or financial issues or a job issue or a kid issue or whatever the, whatever the case may be. Everybody's got something going on. Mm -hmm. And we got to think about that when we deal with people. And that's why one of the things I'm talking about in my campaign is civility. Mm -hmm. we got to stop this yelling. we got to stop the nonsense that's on uh, social media. Mm -hmm. We've got to stop being kind to each other and, and realizing that we're all in this together. You know, there, there's no reason for anyone to, you know, to be lashing out at someone because of of their race, because of their gender, because of their you know, their choice, uh, you know that's that's not who we are. At least that's not who I am. And I, you know, 
Some people, yeah, I know older folks, they just kind of grin and bear it. It's okay, that's what it is, what it is you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's acceptable, I mean, you know. But you know, to, to lash out and say it's wrong and to, to, to have hate crimes against them, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. That should not happen, mm -hmm. you know. Right. And what we, um, you know, what we obviously say is that everyone is who they are. <clears throat> I mean, people, the same way that someone who has red hair, for example, doesn't, choose to have red hair, you know, somebody who's a member of the LGBT yeah. community doesn't mm -hmm. choose that for themselves because look at all the yeah. the vitriol put out in the world, you know, against the LGBT community, against the immigrant community, against marginalized groups in general. Yeah. And so it's a really, um, it's a very difficult place, I think, that a lot of people find themselves. Um, what do you think are the most important social issues happening in Salem right now? Well, I think housing, I guess, obviously is a, is a social issue, mm -hmm. um, and we talked about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the you know the economy is good. They, you know, people can work if they need to work. You know, it's the wages. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, part yeah. of the housing crisis is the wages. I mean, right. let's face it. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're not making you know eighty thousand dollars a year, you're not going to get a nice place to live. That's right. You know, and That's right. so people need to you know. You know, I know I have a small business. We, we have a lot of employees that are all part-time, you know, and uh, they, they get good wages. We, we pay them very well, but they, they work hard for it. Mm -hmm. But their mothers, that are, it's on their second job sometimes. I've got a few single mothers that work three jobs. This is just one of them. Yes. And they're, they're trying to hold things together. And, and, and I think, you know, that's, that's an issue. And, um, you know, we've got to do what we can to... You know, boost the education, but that's a, a lot of it comes down to personal choice too. I mean, we've got Salem State, we've got pl plenty of educational mm -hmm. institutions around where people can create opportunities and mm -hmm. uh, you know better themselves by education, therefore earning more money. Um, mm -hmm. I'd urge anybody that has any inkling of our idea of starting a business to do it. Mm -hmm. um, take the first step. Go mm -hmm. to Salem State College to the business center or the enterprise center and start talking to people there. And that's where you get involved with business planning and banking and how, this is how you do it. This is okay. step one. You can talk to people that have been in business. You know? mm -hmm. I started my business with nothing. A lot of people have and they're willing to mentor and talk to people that, that want to start a business. In the long run, they'll be better off. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And how do, other than starting your own businesses, how are people going to afford to stay in Salem? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, definitely people are coming up from Boston. Yeah. You know, there's a the lot problem, of gentrification yeah. already happening. Well, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> how do Salemites stay Salemites? Well, it's, it's, hard. it's hard. I mean, you have to, you have to, you have to be, able to be able to afford it. It's, uh, when I was younger, you know, my wife and I were in college. We lived in apartments, you know, mm -hmm. two or three people at a time. Um, it wasn't nearly expensive as it is today, but, um, but that's what we did. You mm -hmm. know, when we bought our first house, we were we were well over thirty percent. We just wanted to get in, right? Um, and then the market went south. So, that's but right. then we bought another one. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you know, but we've always been. You know, and my wife's had her business. My wife's had a business for forty years now. She owns a Baker School of Gymnastics in Salem, and mm -hmm. uh, so she's always she's always worked for herself. And you know, we've, and we've had our own home now for the last 20, 25 years. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we're fortunate, but it, it, it's tough getting started. You know, yeah. my daughter is, you know, she's, she's in her early 30s, and, um, you know, she's lived with us, which is great. You know, we have plenty of room, and, and, but she, you know, for her to go out and get a place on her own, it's right. 1800 bucks a month. It, right, it's very, you know? it's very expensive, yeah. right? And, that's what, and a lot of young people are leaving, a lot of older people are leaving, and, yeah. you know, it's this on-rolling hell, it seems. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, speaking of, in terms of, like, downtown housing, all the, the different areas of the city. Yeah. Um, we had um, one of our readers contact us, and his name is Felipe, and he lives in Salem, and he asked a question um, for all the at-large candidates. Mm -hmm. And he says, there's a clear disparity in the cleanliness and street maintenance of Salem neighborhoods, with poorer areas being less clean and less maintained than wealthier ones. What policies and strategies would you pursue to fix this situation? Well, I'm not familiar with how they do that maintenance now, mm -hmm. um, but obviously if it's not being done equally around the city, it should be. Um, you'd have to look at that policy, get the department head in, talk to the mayor's office, say, hey, how can we make this more equitable? Mm -hmm. You know, why is this you know, happening? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, we, the city used to do a lot more. I know their resources are, are lower than they used to be, but 
But we can afford to keep our streets clean. We can right. afford to keep our streets in relatively decent shape, right. paving and all that stuff. Um, but it, it, it should be done. I mean, when I was a kid, I used to work at Palmer Cove uh, Playground, and every morning the, my job was to rake the seaweed off the little beach, mm -hmm. and the city truck would come down and take the seaweed. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we could do that then, mm -hmm. why can't we clean the streets now? I mean, right. I, I don't... That's certainly something we should be able to do. Mm -hmm. And do you think, in terms of resources that and funding that's going into like maintenance and street cleaning and stuff like that, that each neighborhood should be treated equitably in that sense? Well, it, 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 each neighborhood different. They have different needs. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, if you take the Willows for example, with the red on the water, mm -hmm. it has different needs than we have in uh, Castle Hill. Right. So yeah. in, in equity, I mean, equity, equity. You know, within the with their needs, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, we have to, you know, we've got a huge project in Castle Hill, with, that bridge has to be rebuilt, that's going to be a very expensive proposition, mm -hmm. uh, probably a traffic nightmare too, because mm -hmm. that's, you know, it goes right over the tracks at St. Anne's Church, mm -hmm. that's something, you know, it's, it's coming, Right. <laughs> it's, gonna, right. it's coming, so we're going to have to get some funding for it. Right, exactly. You know. Where do you stand on the LGBT community in general? I'm supportive, I, I, I think, uh, I think it's great that Salem has become a, Salem's a tolerant city, and, and people have come here, and they've and they've been welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I I've got some I've met some wonderful folks in Salem, you know. I, I have gay friends and all that, and it, it, it just doesn't it doesn't mean make me any difference to me. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and, and I think they, I think it adds a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. I had some great conversation with it. Doesn't matter to me. I'm just so used to it, and I. It's like, no, I don't, I don't have any issues with this. <laughs> okay. well, George, what are your top three priorities, would you say? If you were elected yeah. and sitting on the council, what would yeah. be your top three priorities? My top three priorities? Yeah. Well, one is, is, is to uh, try to bring back a little bit of some of the old council traditions that made it function better. Such as? Such as not getting involved in other people's races, mm -hmm. for one, because I think that causes a friction that carries over into the session. And when it does, it, it, that's what you see. That we see now. You see in splits. You see mm -hmm. people that don't like each other, don't respect each other. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, that's the reason why. And I like all. I think everybody that's running. I think everybody that's on the council. I respect all of them. But I think when you start to get involved in the political start, mm -hmm. side of other people's races. It doesn't make for a good functioning council the next year, mm -hmm. no matter who gets there. So I think, and that used to be kind of an unwritten rule. Mm -hmm. It was a, it, it, but there, but it happened, mm -hmm. but but it, not to the extent that it's happening today, mm -hmm. and, and and it really never caused the division that it's causing today. And I, I clearly believe that's why. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd, I'd like to be able to be, you know, remind people of some of those things that we used to do that made us function better. Mm -hmm. Two, I want to lead. You know, I, I want to be able to, to reach out and, and, you know, be a leader in the community and, and, and mentor the younger folks that want to, uh, you know, want to learn. You know, they're on the council or the working for the city or whatever they are. I mean, I've been around. I've got some knowledge. I want to give it away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's free. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, Education's always good, right? Yeah. And, and, and thirdly, uh, you know, we keep that place civil up there. We can't, you, you, you got to, you know, we have to do... You have to do government right. You know, my father used to say there's 40, over 40,000 people in the city and there's 11 of us and we've got to act responsibly. And, you know, it's an honor, you know. So to be down there fighting and yelling and all that stuff, we've got to stop that. What do you see Salem to look like over the next two or three years? What is your vision for it? What would you like to see Salem look like? Uh, I would like to see it to continue to... to to grow as it, as it is, it, and I'm talking to a couple of different. One, I, I want to see it continue to grow business-wise. I mean, I think it's fantastic. I mean, even though we got to put up with the traffic in October, mm -hmm. this is this is great what we have. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, October is just a tremendous month mm -hmm. for for everybody that works here. Everybody has a business here. Everybody that comes here, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, I, I think that's wonderful. And I, I want to see that continue to grow and foster. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, I want to see the the stuff on the waterfront continue. You know, I want to see the development. Uh, down at uh, the new power plant. There's a whole strip of land down at the new mm -hmm. power plant that's going to be developed, and hopefully for commercial and re marine-related uses, you know, which will bring in a higher tax rate you know, to the city. Mm -hmm. It's out of the way. It's not close to neighborhoods. It's an ideal spot. Mm -hmm. I know the mayor uh, has a port authority to put together to work on that. Yeah. So I want to see us continue to grow, but I want to see us continue to grow smartly. You know? 
density in housing, I think, is in and around the downtown area is fine. I think when you get out towards the neighborhoods, you get a whoa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because you get single family homes, uh, single family neighborhoods, you know, two family neighborhoods, and we've got to preserve them. I mean, mm -hmm. that's part of Salem. You know, mm -hmm. There was all ethnic communities in Salem. There was the French community down by the point. There was you know, the Irish in Gallows Hill, the Italians in Ward 3, you know, and go on and on. And, but they were, they were unique. Right. And I think we need to, you know, remember that and keep those neighborhoods unique. Thank you so much, George. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Okay, thank you. And uh, thanks for sitting down with us, and good luck in the rest of your campaign. Thank you very much. It's okay. my pleasure. Take care. All right.